Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvise Shashanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our Bhakti Shastri course where we're studying Bhagavad Gita. Uh, let me share the screen here. Okay, is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? You yes, can, you're yeah. So we're going on this morning into Unit 2, the Yoga Ladder and Jnana in Bhagavad Gita. Unit Overview. Two sections. First of all, the Yoga Ladder in the Bhagavad Gita, four lessons the yoga systems, the yoga ladder, bhakti yoga, the ultimate yoga system, and the topmost yogi. It'd be great yogis. And then section B, Gyan in the Bhagavad Gita, three lessons. Ishvara Jiva and Prakriti, the vision of a Gyani and the perfection of Jnana. So, we have a bit of work ahead of us to complete this unit. The unit aims. Archana, please read. To help the student understand the yoga later and aspect of jnana as described in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3 through Then, continue. Mm. To en enhance the student ability to preach to su uh, superiority. Superiority. Superiority of bhakti over the other yoga system and to apply it in their own life. To help students deepen their appreciation of the main principle of syllable mood and mission in respect to the yoga system as described in Bhagavad Gita chapter 3 to 6. Okay, so three aims, right? Understand the aspects of the yoga ladder and aspects of, understand the yoga ladder and the aspects of Gyan and then to preach about the superiority of Bhakti over other systems and to have a deeper appreciation of Srila Prabhupada's mood and mission in relation to the yoga system. Okay, so lesson one, the yoga systems. We're going to look 
who remembers? What are the yoga systems which are described in the first six chapters? Anybody? Kirtida. Kirtida, Maharaj Are you there? Kirtida not there? So we'll ask somebody else who would like to answer. Krishna Maharaji, Tandar Pandam. Uh, we are ex you have explained uh, uh, three types of yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Buddhi Yoga. Yes, right. Right. Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. Right. There's a few other yogas also going to be introduced. We had also Karma Sanyas or sannyas yoga sannyas yoga is actually the title of the the uh, fifth chapter the, the third chapter is karma yoga and the fifth chapter is sannyas yoga then the sixth chapter is dhyana yoga so we'll hear about these different yogas as we today, hopefully. So objectives here, first of all, understanding the different yoga systems. We'll have an overview of the third chapter. We completed the second chapter, so we're going on to the third chapter. We'll have an overview of the third chapter, the main points, and then an overview of the progression which exists between the different chapters in this first section from chapter 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. And then cite where Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Dhyana Yoga are described in chapters 3 to 6. All right? We should be able to identify different verses which indicate these different kinds of yogas. And then finally explain the respective practices of Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Dhyana Yoga and cite verses. Right? We like to support what we say with evidence, with verses. Okay, so overview of the third chapter. First of all, Arjuna has a question, all right? He wants to know, sh should he fight or is knowledge being recommended? Krishna had, the, Krishna had spoke about the importance of, he'd been giving Sankhya. He was talking about Sankhya, which is actually Jnana. And so Arjuna became bewildered, he thought, Jnana means renunciation, and renunciation means not to, not to fight, not to do anything. Arjuna thought renunciation meant not fighting. He could not understand that one could be renounced and also fight. So Lord Krishna will explain that. But anyway, Arjuna's question is like that. He's confused. So tad ekam vada, say one thing. Arjuna wants Krishna to say one thing. Tell me, what, what is it I'm supposed to do? And then Krishna replies and he explains, karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. Actually, we've covered several of these verses already when we were discussing how karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. Karma sannyas means stopping work giving up all activities and just stopping everything, renouncing activity. And karma yoga is renounce, renouncing the fruit of the action. So karma yoga was considered superior to karma sanya. So that's going, that's explained. And then the next section describes 
from karma kanda to karma yoga. Now, why would we go back to karma kanda? Well, one reason is not everyone's able to perform karma yoga. Karma sannyas is really hard, but karma, even karma yoga is difficult for people. Therefore, Lord Krishna explains karma kanda, and he explains how by doing karma kanda, gradually they may come to karma yoga. That's a, that's a hope anyway. The karma kanda is enjoying the results, enjoying the fruit. We, we want the fruit, we want to enjoy it. And karma yoga is where you become a little bit detached from the, the fruit, gradually. There's different levels of karma yoga. There's karma yoga where one is very, very attached to the fruit, sakam karma yoga. And then there's Nishkam Karma Yoga. And Nishkam Karma Yoga is where one is very detached from the fruit. But both conditions of Karma Yoga, the yogi is attached to working in a particular way. He wants to perform a particular activity. But he may become detached from the fruit. And Karma Kanda is just to enjoy the fruit do what we have to to enjoy the fruit. And then chapter 3 continues, 17 to 21, describing about Atma Rati, meaning they have no duty, no duty to perform, but still they act to set the example. This is what we call the Acharya principle to teach by example. We spoke about it yesterday. So this is described in the third chapter. Atmarati. He's taking pleasure in the self, so he doesn't have to perform, he doesn't feel the need to do anything, but still he will act because the importance is there to set an example. And then we will hear how Lord Krishna also sets an example. Although Lord Krishna doesn't have to do anything, we heard this also previously, Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord and he doesn't need to work, but he, he works to teach by his example. Then, don't disturb the attached. Don't disturb those who are attached to the fruit. Just be an example, show an example. Again, the importance of teaching by example. Krishna consciousness is meant to create people of good character, to show an example to others. The, the devotees should all be. Prabhupada was on the television in America and the interviewer asked him, how would we recognize a devotee of Krishna? And Prabhupada said, Oh, he would be a perfect gentleman. So this is the idea that we have to show the example. We should, we should, devotees should be people of the highest character, no sinful activities, and they should behave very nicely also. Important that people should appreciate the devotees. And the, the way in which they can appreciate is when they see the devotees behave nicely and set a good example. And then the, the last section of the chapter, Nitya Varina, eternal enemy, lust. So we'll be looking at that. We haven't looked at that yet. That's the last part of the third chapter. All right, so those are the main sections of the third chapter. Let's have somebody read. Who would like to read the slide, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj Liyan. Please. Lust, the eternal enemy. Arjun vacha atha ke nagda yukto yam papam charati purusha anicham api varshneya Balad Eva Niyojitaha, O descendant of Krishna, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? Bhagavad Gita 3.36.
Yes, Arjuna is asking this question because uh, Lord Krishna was describing we should perform our duty and we shouldn't do another's duty. And so Arjuna is asking, well, what if sometimes we do something which, you know, it wasn't really our duty, we do something, we, we, we do some sinful activity. And we, we, we were not aware of it, we did it un, un -think, without thinking. So even unwillingly, as if somehow engaged by force. So very important question. We have to understand this. And Lord Krishna will reply, oh, okay, we give the exercise. So, <laughs> we're going to give you an exercise, let you do it. Ident read your allocated verse in purport. So, we have different verses. Yagna? Yagna Prabhu? Where is this? I have to... We're going to put you into groups and we have to identify the principles from Krishna's analysis of lust, right? And then present the principles which you've identified. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes Prabhu, we want to make some groups Prabhu. We want, we want six, six groups. How many people do we have? It, uh, today, 18 Maharaj, mm -hmm. uh, 16, uh, are they, 16 are there, some are, some are using one laptop, uh, two devotees are using one laptop. Okay, so groups of three will be okay, three, yes, pe Maharaj. three people in each group, and we'll have group one do 337. Group 2 will do verse number 339 and group 3, 341. Then group 4 will do 337, group 5, 239 and group 6, 341. Right? And here's the question again. Read your verse and purport. Identify general principles from Krishna's analysis of lust and then present these principles to the class. Is it clear? Total six groups we have to make, Maharaj? Yes, six. Okay, Maharaj.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj ji. Which, which so verse? Reading the uh, text before discussing. Your text is which? 39? Yes, Maharaj ji. Okay. I'll leave you to Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Just the two of you in the group. Our souls are different. Our vidyan things, what our relates, our souls relationship with the Supreme Lord. So it explains. Is Kohan Prabhu there? Maharaj, you are on mute. Oh, sorry. Mm. Is, is Kohan with you? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're doing 341? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay. So I'll let you read it more. Less lust is only the perverted reflection of the love of God within in the natural for every living entity. So we need to curb. Lust is always going to be. Mm -hmm. So perverted reflection. Yeah, yeah. It's a reflection. Yeah, the lust is going to be because it's a, even if it is a reflection. Lust is going to be there, but we have to curb it in the very beginning. No, actually, I think what you are saying is that lust is perverted reflection of love of body, which is natural for any living. Yes. Love of body is natural, right? For any body. But we have to properly channelize it. Curb it, select, channelize properly from the beginning. How can we channelize by the Krishna consciousness? Yes. That is a simple thing. Oh, so much. Maharaj, can I ask you one question? Yes. How is everything in Mayapur? <laughs> well, going on <laughs> in, the, in the restricted ways, you know. Darshan is only open for a couple hours a day. Everyone's quite cautious. Anyway, classes are going on. Bhakti Shastri is going on. Bhakti Vai Bhav, Bengali. So, so is Bamsi Bhavan uh, filled up? Like, I mean, is it like lots of devotees sick? No, no, not so much, no. Thank 
Krishna consciousness is very powerful. The late beginner can become to the lover of the God by following the regular utility principles of the devotional service. So, for whom shall we summarize? Yes, yes, we can start from my So, the first point here is that uh, Krishna is uh, asking us to serve the last from the very beginning. Yes. Uh, last is the destroyer of knowledge and self realization. So, how? Okay. You are muted, Maharaj. Oh. I, th I think we could just about finish off, Prabhu. I think we could close the meeting, bring them out. Let's talk.
hear what they've found out. Okay, Maharaj, I'm closing. So everyone's back? Not, not yet, Maharaj. I think must be back now. Yes, Maharaj. Now, now everything is done. Okay. So, group. Let's have group number one. Group number four can begin. Let's hear group number four. Three thirty-three. Three thirty-seven. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So I'll be representing group four. So can I start by reading out the first Maharaj, the text, uh, the translation side. Okay. Yeah. The Supreme Personality of God had said, It is lust only, Arjuna, which is born of contact with the material mode of passion, and later transformed into wrath, and which is all devouring sinful enemy of the world. So, we discussed in the purport that how um, Prabhupada talks about um, the process of the, uh, you know, um, what happens when there is lust and then it is unsatisfied. So. The lust actually begins, um, it is born out of contact with material mode of passion. And then later on it turns into wrath, so which is the greatest enemy, you know, the uh, sinful enemy of the world. So when the living entity comes in contact with material world, the love are uh, transformed into lust. So this is uh, like an analogy given uh, how milk turns into yogurt when it comes in uh, contact with anything, you know, acidic or tamarind. So uh, that's why, you know, lust is in, uh, it, it, because of the mode of passion. So unsatisfied lust provides his, you know, causes extreme anger. And then that, you know, further continues to the illusion. And that's why we kind of remain in this material world. And ignorance, uh, he says, is uh, the wrath is manifestation in the mode of ignorance. So from mode of passion, you're falling into mode of ignorance. So instead of falling from mode of passion, further degrading down, if we elevate this to mode of goodness by prescribed uh, method of living and acting, then there is a chance, uh, you know, of being saved from degradation and go to spiritual advancement. Then Prabhupada describes how, you know, we as living entities are independent. We have like in a small independence because we are parts and parts of Lord and Lord is independent. So this independence, if we misuse it, then we have this tendency to, um, you know, propensity to enjoy instead of serving the Lord. And we come, we, our, our major duty is our you know, duty is to inquire about the Lord, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. And uh, then he talks about how lust is also a part of Lord. It comes from Lord, Supreme Lord himself. So um, the, uh, you know, falling down into material world uh, is, it is because we want to enjoy instead of serving the Lord. So we have propensity to Lord over material nature. And, um, in the last paragraph, Prabhupada also gives an example how although wrath and you know uh, the anger is there, you could also use it in the service of the Lord, like how uh, Hanuman used it in the service of Lord Rama by burning Lanka. And then Krishna is also saying that over here, you know, in the battlefield, Arjuna could use this anger uh, in fighting instead of you know falling down. So that's what we concluded. Okay, so are you? Would you be able to utilize your anger in the service of Krishna? Um, yes, Maharaj, depending on the situation. If there is someone attacking devotees or, you know, um, yeah, there, there, are, there are circumstances where we can also use our anger for Krishna. Okay, good.
All right, let's hear group number one. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, I'm presenting uh, 337 from our group. Yeah, the same guy. So, Mataji mostly covered everything. Uh, there was a session. Uh, what we discussed was, as also everything comes from Krishna, uh, the origin of lust also comes also from Krishna. So, as mentioned by Prabhupada, when living entity comes in contact with the material creation, uh, living entity's uh, pure love, uh, that uh, when it is associated with the material emotion, that turns into a lust. And then uh, when the lust is also transformed into, um, the sense of love, of love of Godhead also becomes transformed into lust. As the example also mentioned, milk in contact with uh, so tamarind is transformed into yogurt. Then again, the lust is unsatisfied. It turns into breath. Breath is transformed into illusion. And that particular illusion continues the material existence. So Krishna's emphasizing lust is the greatest enemy of the living entity. So when the lust is not, is not satisfied, it turns into breath. But, but analysis, uh, analysis is something like when, when we utilize this lust and you know, breath in the service of Krishna consciousness, business. Uh, in the case of Hanuman, he perfectly used this wrath by burning the uh, golden city of Ravana. Also, another example, Arjuna used this, uh, um, his wrath upon his enemies for the satisfaction of the Lord. Uh, Lord. Um, in case of Prabhupada also, uh, Prabhupada perfectly, when the day was, uh, uh, when, when he was trying to construct the temples, especially in the case of uh, Juhu, he was really angry and then he used to breath for the service of Krishna. So, this is what uh, I would present Maharaj from our group. Would you be able to apply any of these principles in your own Krishna consciousness? Yeah, definitely Maharaj. I always use, <laughs> sometimes I use, we definitely use. Because in, in any case of, you know, as Mataji also mentioned, there was any misbehavior on the devotees, definitely, um, then Raj should be utilized for the sake of protecting the devotees. How can we elevate ourselves more to the mode of goodness? By, by avoiding the passion. Can you give me some practical... Can you give me some practical ways I could avoid the passion? Uh, <clears throat> for example, if one has a really passion, passionate nature, <clears throat> that can be utilized as Sankirtan. Uh, for example, uh, book distribution, that passion can be utilized. Uh, really? I don't know. That could create problems out there. You put a passionate person out there, people may not the public may get really put off. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone ha can have a passion like suffering they want for person case of like passion can be uh, vicious, where they have a tendency um, to achieve more or gain more. And that passion nature can be like, you know, uh, for the book distribution. Uh, well, is it good to is it is it good to present that kind of image to the public? Not necessarily, but not necessarily. Anyway, I, I was just saying, Prabhupada wrote here that we should elevate to the mode of goodness by the prescribed method of living and acting. So I just want to know more. What is this prescribed method of living and acting? Saki Harini. Um, following one's duty and Varnashrama Dharma, just following your own uh, duties, then you can engage, you can elevate into a higher mode. How does it apply to us? To us? Yeah. How can we, what are the prescribed duties? What's the, pre the 
prescribed method of living and acting for devotees like herself, not living in temple, you're not living in the temple. So how you, what is the prescribed method of living and acting? So we could um, use our time in hearing and chanting of the Lord when we are at work. We earn some money, we can donate to the temple for his services and um, we can, you know, preach about like whenever we have time and not living in the temple so we, we can tell our friends about Lord Krishna and but with that we can probably like you know like, instead of degrading our mind and thinking about something else engage in Krishna's service I don't know how much you could apply these principles, you know, tell your friends about Krishna. They probably know about Krishna. They already know they, they're your friends, you know, they have, I don't know how much you can tell them or how often you can tell them. Prescribed method of living and acting. Maybe Maharaj, uh, sometimes not even saying something, but why your behavior? Oh yes, definitely. That is, Behave. that is the you don't have to speak. Just uh, you, the action make the um, preaching itself. So mm -hmm. even though we we big just book distributing, uh, uh, so yeah, we can always uh, passion is inside of uh, elevating that soul to uh, like uh, on the higher level but you don't have to show that passion you have to show compassion more than the passion oh very nice yeah show compassion rather than passion yes that's a very nice point yeah thank you show uh, some Hare Krishna Maharaj is that the passion is the only kind of driving force in this material world someone has a passion for achieving Krishna consciousness, like coming, um, chanting more rounds, and that could be, is that the, is that the driving force Maharaj, or is without passion and how we can perform really our daily and devotion, especially the hostas, and we need to have a passion in a way, like working and uh, passion for the raising children. Of course, that should be in the mode of goodness. Well, yeah, the, the, you have to remember, Bhagavad Gita tells us that uh, the result of actions in the mode of passion is distress. The simply acting in the mode of passion it will lead to distress. So we have to be very cautious about dealing with passion. And that Prabhupada oh. makes the point, we have to elevate to the mode of goodness. Maharaj, we often see like people uh, has uh, so much passion for creating something and we use, we're trying to use them for uh, arranging the festivals and uh, arranging the... Uh, yes, but it, it shouldn't be passion, it should be in the mode of goodness. Uh, Maharaj, uh, just one example I would like to give how to transform this right into service of Krishna. Uh, recently, one so-called Sadhguru has uh, made very derogatory comments about Lord Krishna. Uh, but one one devotee from Iskand Delhi, uh, Amog Lila Prabhu, he has given a point by point rebuttal uh, using Shastras. So he has given a Shastric references to nullify the so-called Sadhguru's arguments. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, quoting the Shastras to nullify the uh, such derogatory arguments uh, is very good example. Is if somebody uh, derogates Lord Krishna, we we become very angry naturally. But then, to the response should be based on the shastras. That way, uh, the other person also realizes his mistake, and uh, uh, image of Iskon is also uh, kept uh, very humble. Well, I don't know if Shastra is the only way. The Shastra, you see, Shtadguru, he doesn't accept Shastra. He's not going to be so impressed by Shastra. He doesn't speak Shastra. Maybe if you, you can, you, you have to, maybe we could think also of logic. Krishna consciousness is not based only on Shastra. 
But there's also logic there. And so if one can defeat him by logic, that's also very good. Yes, means multiple ways. Yes. Uh, logic, right. Shastra. Right. Not only Shastra. Because people would just say, that's your Shastra. I don't accept your Shastras. Yeah. So we have to be careful about that. Not only just one way. Yeah. All right. And prescribed method of living and acting. Certainly, uh, living and acting means according to our regulative principles, a lifestyle of the sadhana bhakti should be done. This, just by engaging in these different ways. Of course, different programs may go on there, like putting on festivals and so on, but it shouldn't be the mode of passion. And there ha we can use our energy without being influenced by the mode of passion, because passion is a very strong desire that we're thinking, I'm the doer, I'm this, you know. They, they thought that I'm doing this, that, that's, that's a problem. So we want to be uh, can control, in control of our mind and senses. We have to have proper spiritual knowledge. Just like Prabhupada didn't want the devotees just to go out on book distribution. And when he saw that the devotees were going out even in the night, they were out late at night, Prabhupada was upset. He said, why don't they come back for the evening program? And they said, oh, they're distributing books, Prabhupada. But Prabhupada said, no, they should come back. He said, they've been out all day distributing books. They should come back in the evening for the evening program. So we shouldn't become overly influenced by this passion. We have to be very careful. We have to control it very carefully. And the, Prabhupada makes the point, we have to elevate to the mode of goodness. And ultimately, the goal, of course, is to transcend also the mode of goodness. So we come to the mode of goodness by proper method, living and acting. Regulated lifestyle based on hearing and chanting at the same time. We have to perform duties, but regula regulated programs should be there to keep us away from the mode of passion. Because the mode of passion, you want to stop. Oh, I have no time to chant. I'm busy. I'm doing this. No, that's not how it should be. We have to have our de devotional life, our sadhana, very important. All right, let's go on. Text no, the next group. Text number thirty-nine. Group number five. Who's the spokesman? Am I audible now? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Go ahead. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, uh, text 39. Thus the wise living entities, pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. Um, first we would like to mention that uh, in the text itself, lust is called Nitya, Vaira, uh, Nitya Vairina. And it means uh, they, by the eternal enemy. And then Srila Prabhupada gives the anal an analogy. Um, last is in the purport, last is compared with a fire. And as fire cannot be extinguished by adding fuel, at the same, last, at the same way, we cannot satisfy our last by fulfilling our desires. And then uh, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, in the, this world is ruled by the sex. And in the, that's why this material world is called Madhunya Agara, uh, which mean, that means shackled of sex life. And ordinary people, they are compared with prisoners like criminals are kept within bars and the same way we are kept by the sex life. So, 
Um, and the fourth point, we would like to mention that uh, sometimes, uh, it's, even if we satisfy our last dissatisfaction, uh, we feel so-called happiness, but this happiness is the eternal enemy of the sense of joy, as Srila Prabhupada says. So, uh, even satisfying the last and feeling so-called happiness, uh, we feed in our enemy, eternal enemy. So, so what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do to control this lust? What do you do? What do you do to control sex desire? Engage ourselves in the devotional service. The more we engage in the devotional service, uh, the less time we have for um, thinking maybe different unnecessary things. Uh, we should get up early and take shower, and then we do chapa. Then we uh, hold, then we uh, do mandala arati, engage in our all senses. Then we read books of Srila Prabhupada. Then other maybe our duties, fulfill our duties. Is that, go uh, is that going to with, is that going to take away all your des any? Is that going to take away the desire for sex? Well, if there is um, unbearable desire of sex, uh, the devotees they can uh, move to Grihaskasha, maybe, and. Um, Isn't that going to increase the desire? Um, it's going to lessen the desire, I mm -hmm. suppose, because. <laughs> We move to the Grihastha Ashram, it's going to increase the desire. And Prabhupada said, you can't satisfy the desire, you have more desire. And so Grihastha Ashram is just going to increase the desire. Maharaj, would you say, I mean, uh, Krishna says that param tashtra nivartate. Maybe, maybe we need to engage in the uh, higher you know, taste rather than having the taste of the sex life. Yes. How do we get that param jisva? Uh, we can we start with the regulating our our uh, uh, sex desires. So like Grihastha Ashram is meant to regulate it. It's not meant to increase it. So. Well, is it meant to regulate it? Is uh, uh, Grihastha Ashram is meant to, to produce children? Yes. It's meant for children, right? Married life is meant to have one's meant to have children. So once you get children, then your business is finished. Then you have, Maharaj, yes. Uh, can we say that we should elevate our consciousness uh, to the level that uh, uh, for begetting the Krishna conscious child? Yes. Yes, we should purify ourselves. We want to have good children, we have to purify ourselves first. We see like uh, Krishna and Sutapa, they did great austerities to get Krishna as their child. Devahuti and Kardama Muni, they did great, they were doing so much austerity before they had their child, before they had Kapila Muni. Yes, yeah, so yeah, we have to we have to be careful. We have to purify. There had, Prabhupada said married life is like going to a feast and fasting.
we shouldn't think now I'm a grihastha, I can, I can enjoy my senses, I can do what I want, I can satisfy my desires. No. Grihastha life is a responsibility. There has to be control. So we have to be very careful. Feeling of happiness, that is the, the, the maya. That we're thinking this is enjoyment, this is pleasure, this is the illusion. Happiness in the mode of passion always ends in distress. We have to be very careful. Okay, let's hear the other group, group number two. What do you have to say? Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, uh, I am speaking on behalf of our group. So, uh, I have the question as was the lust is an eternal enemy. So, the main principles which we have uh, concluded from this point are that uh, as Sri Prabhupada Ji has explained from Manu Smriti that lust cannot be satisfied by any amount of sense enjoyment. Whatever we get in our life, we want to have more and more. The, there is no ending for that point. So, it's just because we have kept sense gratification in our center instead of Krishna. So, as an, our pure consciousness, pure consciousness is to serve, the, serve Krishna, not our senses. So, we should use our senses to serve Krishna. Then only our uh, desires can be stopped. There is no other solution for that. And, uh, and in this material world, there is no kind of love is there. There is only lust. Everyone wants something in return from another. So where is love? Love is not there. So love is only in uh, where we, we are serving Krishna. The, the ser from serving attitude, love comes. And the analogy uh, the that Sri Prabhupada has given for this is that uh, as like fire goes on increasing, if we constantly supplying the fuel to fire, similarly the desires which are there in our heart goes on increasing if. Uh, uh, even after satisfying one desire, we, we want to have some other desire. Uh, now I, I have uh, just like parents want that uh, uh, my child uh, study in good school. After that, uh, he take education from higher uh, higher education from great university. Then he get a good job. Then married. Then there is no ending of the desires. And the main <coughs> uh, point that Sri Prabhupada has explained here is that of sex life. <coughs> that. Just like the analogy he gave that as criminals are kept within the bars in this material world. Similarly, uh, uh, we all are the criminals because if we don't follow the order of Lord Krishna, then we have to be entangled, uh, uh, we have to be shackled by sex life. Means we will be, uh, this sex life is just like a uh, prison house for all of us. Uh, if we entangle once in that, uh, we will be. Uh, keep rolling and rolling in that. There is no point of coming out of that. So we should be very careful. Just like uh, in Sriman Bhagavatam, the, there was one example is there, like King Kurulva was there. Uh, he was having sex life for so many times, for so long time. So uh, he was just like entangled in that life uh, because he was in the mode of ignorance. Who was, was this? Like what Who Kurulva, was... King Kurulva. King what? King Kurulva. Puru, pur, Puruva. Puruva. Hanj, yes, Prabhuji. Puruva. Ah. Uh, yeah. So okay. he was in the mode of ignorance. Uh, he was just uh, entangled in the sex life. And in the last read, Prabhupada has said that <coughs> the principle he has given that uh, the feeling of happiness, so called feeling of happiness, which we feel in this material world, is just an illusion. We can say that it's just like a that um, mirage uh, we, which we uh, saw in the desert place that uh, war, we see a war, there's water uh, if we go uh, more uh, if we see from far that uh, we see that uh, water is there in the desert place but when we uh, go near to that then we see there's no water it's just like that so it's just an illusion okay uh, yes very good and just uh, if we want to overcome this uh, problem of sex life, <coughs> then we have to keep Krishna in center. Uh, and so how are you going to do that? How are you going to keep Krishna in the center? What are you going to just, do? 
Yeah, just like mentioned before that uh, we have to accept the Grihastha Ashram for this <coughs> to regulate our senses uh, to only one person that uh, and we should follow the devotional practices as well do the 16 rounds if one wants to have a sex life then he they should be uh, perfect in chanting their 16 rounds before that and uh, they should uh, uh, they should have a desire not to only have to fulfill their sense gratification just but they have should they should have a desire to uh, uptize a krishna conscious child so that uh, that he can he or she can also serve Lord Krishna and uh, in that way we can use our uh, senses of sex in the service of Krishna yes and one more thing is that whatever to stop our uh, uh, desires of lust then we should understand that what Lord Krishna have gave us we should be satisfied with that we should not endeavor more to get more things just like if we are in an official life <coughs> whatever salary we are getting we should be satisfied because god knows well than us that what is better for us so we should not extra endeavor in that material things instead we should uh, give, devote our time in serving lord krishna and doing devotional practices okay thank you very much yes i think uh, one point is when couple want to have a child they should think that this child this will be their last birth in the material world Yes, this sir. child will not take birth again. We want to have a child and we want to have such a, a pure soul that this child will not take birth again in the material. This will be their last birth. That should be the mood. Okay. Sri Prabhupada has also mentioned that one should not become a parent if uh, he can't uh, uh, liberate uh, his children from the cycle of birth and death. Yes, right. Okay, thank you, Madhiji. Let's hear from the other group, uh, group number six, text 41. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I will be representing group number six for text 41. Yes. So I'll begin with the translation. Uh, text 41, the translation is, Therefore, O Arjuna, best of the Bharatas, the very beginning, curb the good symbol of sin or lust by regulating the senses and see this destroy of all this and help the world. So uh, in the purpose, Prabhupada explained, that for every living entity, uh, love of God here is natural. But the perverted reflection of this love of God is lust. So the consequence of lust is that it is it is the destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. Meaning jnana, which refers to knowledge of the self, and vijnana refers to the specific knowledge of uh, the soul's relationship with Krishna. So to Krishna, uh, it is takes a uh, in this uh, text that is asking us, uh, is telling us to curb this lust from the very, very beginning. Uh, meaning that from the very beginning, uh, one must be educated in Krishna consciousness so that uh, his natural love for, of Godhead does not uh, convert into lust. So how, how, does, how is this achieved is by following the regulative principles of devotional service. So th this is, uh, Krishna consciousness is so powerful that even uh, late comer, meaning that if you are just coming into Krishna consciousness, you can still uh, practice these regulative principles and of devotional service and still overcome this lust. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is your main principle to conquer over lust? The main principle will be uh, Maharaj to uh, doing our sadhana uh, properly, like for example, like how the other uh, devotees explain, uh, chanting, reading Srila Prabhupada's books. And uh, uh, for me personally, I feel attending the Mangalati would really help in uh, overcoming this. Okay, yes, very, very true. A good start to the day, go to Mangalati, your whole day will be auspicious. All right, let's hear from group number three. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So we have to identify the general principle for Krishna analysis of lust in text 41. So I'll just read the text and try to identify that. Uh, text 41 is mentioned, Krishna is, is, is speaking. Therefore, O Arjuna, best of the Bharatas, in the very beginning, curb this great symbol of 
of lust. This great symbol of sin, lust, by regulating the senses and slaying the destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. So, immediately, Krishna is considering, from his perspective, he's describing lust as a great symbol of sin. And his prescription uh, to rise above this, or to curb this lust, is that one should engage from the very beginning to curb this lust by regulating the senses. Prabhupada mentioned in the purport, the lust is only a perverted reflection of the love of God, of Krishna brain, which is that not is natural to the living entity. Therefore, by engaging the senses in Krishna consciousness, we are able to control the senses. So the, the example is touted from Shri, uh, about Amrish Maharaj. Amrish Maharaj was engaging all his senses very nicely in service to the Lord. So in this way, he remained Krishna conscious and he was able to, uh, to control his senses. As we've seen, even in the example of the Rasa Muni, he was not lost, but yet, uh, even when the Rasa Muni would have lost uh, his composure, and he calls Ambrish Maharaj, Ambrish Maharaj remained very composed as a devotee. So, Prabhupada also mentioned, when the love of God deteriorates into lust, it is very difficult to return to, normal, uh, to the normal condition. Nonetheless, Krishna consciousness is so powerful that even at a later, even as a later beginner, one can become a lover of God yet. So Prabhupada, is, Allah Krishna is telling us that it is very, as from the very beginning, we should try. Prabhupada has mentioned that Krishna consciousness is so powerful that even a person who starts later to regulate the senses in Krishna consciousness, is able to, to curb this loss. So at any stage of life, or from the time of understanding of its urgency, one can begin regulating the senses in Krishna consciousness, devotional service to the Lord, and turn lust into love of God. Yeah, you have and to be very yeah. You have to be very serious, right? If you're a late beginner, you can do it, but you have to be very serious. Very serious. You have to take it up very intensely because we have so many bad habits before becoming a devotee. So it's, you can do it, but it's so much better if you do it from the beginning of life than later in life. Yep. Okay, we'll it's go ahead. Soul. Let's see. How could you apply some of these principles in your own practice of Krishna consciousness? Well, we heard somebody, one devotee said, you go to Mongol RT would be a big help, right? Any other principles you'd like to apply in your own practice that should help you conquer lust? What are you going to do when you get angry and you become influenced by the mode of passion and ignorance? How are you going are you asking to... me a question, Maharaj? Yes, I'm asking a question. You get angry, you I'm lose sorry. control of t your temper, you get angry. What are you going to do about it? We can chant at that, that time, Maharaj. Yes, what? take shelter yeah. of the holy name. Mentioned. Huh? Yeah, we can take shelter of the holy name. Uh, yes, that is the of taking shelter of the holy name, which is the best thing that we can do. But also, uh, the example should probably... Uh, the example is given is that <laughs> it is better when we are angry, please do not react at that time. Wait, try to think over because because anger makes one bewildered and that dries up the intelligence. Right. You know, some of you have children, right? Do you do you ever hit your children? Do you beat them? Not for a very long time. And I, I, I don't really practice doing that part. <laughs> yeah. Some, but, but I did. Yeah, you have to, we have to under, why? We get angry. 
Mm. Get angry at them. Mm. We have to control. Mm -hmm. Difficult. We have yeah, Maharaj, when especially dealing with the children, as you mentioned, like how is it very difficult to control anger sometimes. Yeah. And then neither we cannot really chant uh, that time when we are dealing with the children. Yes, it's true. We have children. Yeah. Hmm? Maharaj, uh, like uh, Prabhu said, we should not uh, react at that time. So uh, I also agree that we should not react but respond. Uh, and we should try to see that situation from different uh, angles and then we should come to certain conclusion, not to directly jump upon the conclusion. Yes, right. We have to control the mind and senses. The tendency is to be overwhelmed, to become controlled by the anger. Then you, you, you hit the child, you beat them, it's not good. Sets a bad example also. So we have Mr. to. Maharaj? Yes. Um, so if I may add something here, um, it also helps sometimes when you are in such a situation. It helps when you talk to a devotee, when you express your devotee. Sometimes it is not helpful if we stay quiet. When we try to do the job, we can focus, and then if we talk to a devotee person uh, to express our feeling, why we are um, angry, and then that we get some spiritual, um, you know, Oh, def definitely. If you, definitely, if a devotee is there, then it's much easier. You feel more, you're, you're more cautious about uh, letting loose of your anger, displaying your anger, and we will try to control it. We may express our dis disapproval but without getting angry, too much angry, because the devotee is there. But when the devotee is not there, when you're just on your, in your own home, maybe only the wife and children are there, or, or the husband and the children, and you, then you could get more angry, you feel more, <laughs> you get more irritated and disturbed. But when a, de a devotee is present, we're more conscious. Right, but in, when the devotee is not present in our home, I guess um, chanting, to me that has happened to me a couple of times, chanting, trying to chant is the best solution, at least for me. Oh, but I can't focus, but mind is not stable, but at least trying to chant is the best. Right, chanting, take shelter, yeah, yeah take your beat bag, go out for a walk and calm down. Right, go mind out. cannot be stable, but at least keeps me from saying more uh, negative words and trying to keep me from speaking more and I uh, am, yeah. Yes. We're often, yeah, we're often challenged. We're often, Prabhupada also would get angry. He would get angry, but only for a moment. You know, he could always control it. He, he would say, oh, who did this? He'd be angry. And then he'd say, do something about it. Then he would just, you know, he would forget. He wouldn't. He wouldn't hold this anger. We, sometimes we see people get angry, and they're angry for days. So we don't want to be like that, definitely. So practice Krishna consciousness. So these principles, avoiding anger and like that, are. If, of course there may be some justification for anger, just as we heard Hanuman and Arjuna, they could use their anger. But unless one is the master of the senses, one should not try to use anger until you have actually control over your own mind and senses. Then don't try to use anger in the service of Krishna because it will go against us. It becomes just simply, it, it, it's, not, it's not for our Krishna consciousness. It's just because of our own ego that we are disturbed. So be careful about trying to use anger in the service of Krishna. First become controller of the mind and senses. Okay, we'll go ahead. So we're going to talk about the yoga systems. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? I have a question. So everything can be utilized in the service of Krishna. Since we're in the topic of lust, passion, and stuff like that, how? Uh, can we be specific how can lust or passion 
be engaged in the service of Krishna? Well, love means to Krishna. Love is meant for Krishna. We give our love to Krishna. Yeah, so that is what is mentioned is a perverted reflection of Krishna's prema, Krishna prema lost. Yes. That is what is meant by that statement. Uh -huh. That's right. Thank you. Okay, the yoga systems, factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal. But to analyze bhakti yoga minutely, one has to understand these other yogas. From Prabhupada's purport in 647. So we're going to spend some time looking at these other yogas. Someone can read this, please? Please, Prabhu. Thanks, Prabhu. In the previous chapter, as a prelude to the Bhagavad Gita, many different parts were explained. This was all presented unsystematically. A more organized outline of path would be necessary for action and understanding. In other words, by his question, he is clearing the path of Krishna consciousness for all the students who seriously want to understand the mystery of Bhagavad Gita. Yes. Three. Two, purport, right? Okay, so we're going to look at the progression between the chapters. So chapter 3, the title of chapter 3 is actually Karma Yoga. Right, that's, that's both in Prabhupada's book and in the original Bhagavad Gita in the Sanskrit. Karma Yoga. And we've seen, we've also put Karma Kanda because Lord Krishna was describing about Karma Kanda there in the third chapter. Beginning, you know, first of all, he was talking, he was replying to Arjuna's question about Karma Yoga being better than Karma Sanyas. And then Krishna came back to speak about Karma Kanda again. Because not everybody can un is able to do karma yoga. So karma kanda is not actually a spiritual process. It's material. It's for satisfying material desires, for our sense gratification. So that was mentioned first here, karma kanda and karma yoga. It's, you know, getting rid of the lust and all that, regulating the senses. We want to do karma yoga detached work. We become lusty because we're so attached. We have to get rid of that attachment. And then you can actually do karma yoga. So karma yoga means we're still attached, we're attached to work, working in a particular way, but we're giving up some of the fruit gradually. So this is chapter 3, karma yoga. Then chapter 4, Chapter 4 was Transcendental Knowledge in our English book, right? And it's described here, Jnana Yoga, Chapter 4. The main subject matter of Chapter 4 was Jnana Yoga. From Karma Yoga, we come to Jnana Yoga. In the Chapter 4, Lord Krishna was describing about how he appears and the purpose of his appearance and his mission. So this is Gyan. We heard also about different sacrifices one could do to get knowledge. We heard about approaching the spiritual master. In chapter 4, verse 34, try to learn the truth by approaching the spiritual master. So that was all called there in chapter 4. So chapter 4, Jnana Yoga. And then chapter 5, also some Jnana Yoga, but we've got more, Karma Sanyash Yoga. Karma Sanyash Yoga. The, actually, the, our, cha, our title is Karma Yoga, Karma Yoga, work in Krishna consciousness. I think Prabhupada called the chapter, fifth chapter. 
But the Sanskrit title in the original text of Bhagavad Gita is simply Sanyash Yoga. So Karma Sanyash Yoga, renouncing work, the yoga of renouncing work. And this is actually not much different from Jnana Yoga. The Jnanis, the Jnani, what do they do? They will meditate, they will sit and meditate, or they will read the Vedanta Sutra, just like the Mayavadi sannyasis. Remember when Lord Chaitanya went to Benares, the Mayavadi sannyasis, they were crit crit critical of Lord Chaitanya, that he's singing and dancing, he's a sentimentalist, he should be studying Vedanta like us. So the Mayavadi sannyasis, they're jnanis. And they study the Vedanta, they speculate on it. So Jnana Yoga, that's it. Just study book, read the books, learn, the, learn understand, speculate, put their own meanings into the philosophy. Vedanta Sutra is very difficult to understand, so they have to speculate on the meaning. So this Jnana Yoga or Karma Sanyash Yoga, and then chapter 6, Dhyana Yoga, the yoga of meditation, right? It's going to be described in the chapter 6. So we see these, this is like a progression in yoga. Karma Kanda, working to fulfill our material desires. Then Karma Yoga, working but detaching from the fruit and jnana yoga cultivating knowledge and then karma yoga sannyas karma sannyas yoga working with the knowledge using the knowledge but working also not stopping work and then chapter six dhyana yoga because we got knowledge We've got the knowledge, so we meditate on the knowledge. So dhyana yoga, using this knowledge to meditate. So you can see karma yoga, to dhyana yoga, and then to dhyana yoga. So working in a detached way, and then getting knowledge, and then detaching ourselves from the fruit of the work here, and then finally meditating on that knowledge. Chapter 6. Dhyana Yoga, you'll see it describing Astanga Yoga. Astanga Yoga is mainly meditation. So this is the progression from chapter 3 to chapter 6. Right? Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Sanyas Yoga, Dhyana Yoga. So like that, from one level to the other, the progression in yoga. Maharaj, yes? can I ask a question? Yes. So what is the difference between the chapter through three karma yoga and uh, when we go to, uh, like I thought karma yoga in chapter three means we work without, uh, without attachment to the results. So is, isn't, is it the same thing in chapter 5 also, which is Karma Sanyas Yoga? Well, it's, you see, we've, we've, Karma Sanyas Yoga is definitely not like Karma Yoga. Karma Sanyas Yoga is more giving up the work. Giving up the work. And you can see, we've mentioned it also as Jnana Yoga because the jnani is not going to work. They just sit and contemplate, meditate, speculate. Chapter 3, Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, working in a detached manner, detaching oneself from the result. There's different levels of Karma Yoga, you see. One may do Karma Yoga and he may only give a very small percentage of the result, right? Maybe you're working just like ordinary people, they have jobs. So they're working and they, give a, they may give some 
donation every month they give 10 rupees or something like that, some small amount they're giving every month as a donation. So that could be karma yoga, but that's sakama karma yoga. That's karma yoga with an attachment to the results. But niskam karma yoga is working with detached from the result, that you're giving all the result for the service of, the, uh, service of Krishna. Niskam karma yoga is very close to bhakti yoga. The karma yogi, he's attached to working in a particular way. He identifies himself with a particular occupation. But they gradually start to sacrifice some of the fruit of the work. So the karma sannyas yoga is giving up the work. The jnana yoga also, you're giving up the work. The jnana yogi is not going to be working. He's going to be just contemplating, studying, reading the books, meditating, doing renunciation. And this is also karma sannyas yoga. So it's like that. When we come to chapter 5, and we, we're, we're just beginning chapter 3, so, so we, we have, yeah, let's look at chapter 3 first, and then when we come to chapter 5, we'll compare more between chapter 3 and chapter 5. But for now, we want to understand the different processes. Karma Yoga, Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Sanyash Yoga, and Dhyana Yoga. How there's a progression, there's a connection from them through the chapters. So we will explain more about chapter 5 when we come to it. The yoga processes. We've listed here the different verses where the yoga processes are described. Karma Yoga, chapter 2, 48. Jnana Yoga, chapter 5. 22, 20, and Dhyana Yoga, 6, 13 to 14. So, you have your group, right? Read the given sections, discuss the main points of the yoga process. And if you have time, you can do a drama, show the yoga process. Okay, you have to do it quickly. So, you have groups, we have six groups, so group one and group four will do karma yoga, and group two and group five, jnana yoga, and group three and group six, dhyana yoga. And then we will hear from you. Yagna? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Can we go back to the groups again? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, could you explain tasks again one more time? <clears throat> because it's a little confusing. What do you want me to explain? Which group has to present which... Uh... Group number one and group number four should do karma yoga. Uh -huh. And group two and group five, jnana yoga. And group three and group six, dhyana yoga.
Okay, Yagna Prabhu. Yagna? I, I think we can close the groups. Okay, everybody back? Yes, Maharaj. All right, so let's hear group number one can tell us about karma yoga. A different spokesman, right? Everyone should get a chance to speak. Spokesman, the main point, uh, main point of the uh, yoga system. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, so I'm uh, speaking from the book uh, one. Uh, first of all, yoga means uh, to concentrate our mind at Krishna and uh, it, it to connect us to, uh, just connect us to the Lord. And the second point is that we have to do um, our karma and um, the result is whatever result we get. Um, good or bad, so we just have to offer uh, the Lord, whether loss or profit. And uh, we also have to um, surrender to Krishna, and we cannot do anything, any yoga, um, without surrender, surrendering to Him. And our purpose, our only purpose is to be in service to Krishna, and, uh, just, and also our purpose is to satisfy His senses not to ours. Our only purpose is to just surrender unto him and satisfy to him and do our uh, karma. So it seems like you make karma yoga a very internal thing. Is it? Manaji? Um, yes, Maharaj. Yes. I'm not so sure that karma yoga is just simply so internal. Let's hear group number four. Hare Krishna Gurudev. So we, yeah, we have drama Gurudev. Oh, you have a drama. Oh. Okay. Okay, so in the drama we have three of us. Abhay Mahajan Prabhu and Saki Harini and me. So I will be the one with uh, one with the knowledge of Karma Yoga and Saki Harini will I be the one. I am the one, one who just is a yoga teacher and I teach how to act in yoga as for the modern yoga and then try to solve the problem and Abhay Mahajan Prabhu is the one who is confused and is coming for some uh, advice. Inactive person maybe. Yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna Abhi Mahajan Prabhu, welcome to the yoga studio. Today, what is your problem? Let me fix everything. Mataji, I have problem, but I also don't have a problem. But uh, your gymnastic yoga looks good to me. At least it gives me a five-minute kick. But uh, after that, I am again back to the same problem. So Prabhu, let's just go back, sit down, bring your yoga mat, sit in the Padma Asana. Let's just breathe in and breathe out and forget all your problems, Prabhu. This is yoga. Let's do this. Just continue the unknown below with me. Forget all your 
forget that you have a problem. You don't have a problem. You are Brahma and you are God, Prabhu. Everything is over. You're, you'll be doing very fine. So when you go back, don't think about anything. You don't have any problem. So that is your problem, Prabhu. Just forget everything. But after I forget, how, what, what will I do? Just sit down and do yoga. I'm too much confused. Can somebody please uh, tell me okay. something? Okay. Abhay Mahajan Prabhu, I can give you some advice. What you can do is you want to, you need to know the real meaning of yoga. What does the yoga mean? Yoga is not only uh, for your body, but real yoga means to connect you with the Supreme. That is called yoga. And when you uh, know that and you try to uh, control your senses, uh, like your mind and all the, uh, re you try to regulate your senses, and then you will be, you will be, uh, master of your mind like you can control your mind and the best thing to do that is uh, you try to uh, connect with the supreme lord that is krishna and in this way all your problem will be solved like you don't get too attached with the result of your work and try to you know uh, utilize or give that to krishna and just do things uh, as your duty that will be the best advice. Mataji will it, but Mataji, will it give results for uh, half an hour at the time I do this, or how long it will give the result? I'm confused. It will, it needs uh, practice. So you need some time. You need time to, uh, you might not see the result immediately, but you know, uh, gradually uh, you will, you will. The permanent uh, results? Or yeah, it's permanent. Be. It's permanent. Because, yeah, that's the essence of yoga. Okay, I'll try to do that and let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Okay, I, I, would, I would like to see more emphasis on offering something to Krishna. Not just saying, think of Krishna or do it for, you know, but what you're actually going to give to Krishna. You see? It's, it, it's after you've done something, you, you do your work, you get some fruit, and you give it to Krishna. That is karma yoga. Right? It comes at the, the, it's at the end. You do, you do your duty, and you get the result, then you give it to Krishna. That is the detached, that's how you become detached. You give the result away, you give it to Krishna. So <laughs> you have to, you, have, you naturally become detached when you give it away to Krishna. And by giving to Krishna, you get purified. Okay, let's go. Yes? So it, it is like whatever I have done in, in my business, I give it uh, some, some percentage of it to Krishna. So it's, it's like that. Yes, right. Even if, even if that business is not directly linked to the uh, Krishna. Yes. Right? Yeah, you do business, you give something to Krishna, you give some percentage. Okay. Yeah, that's karma yoga. Okay, let's hear group number, uh, group number two, Dhyana Yoga. Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, uh, me and uh, Pasarthi Prabhuji are presenting a drama on this. So, uh, I will be acting, acting as a counsellor and he will be a counsellor. He will ask questions from me. To like this. Hare Krishna Pasati Prabhuji, uh, you have come after so long time to this own temple. Why are you looking so sad? Is everything fine in your life? No, nothing fine. Nothing is fine with me. Uh, Oops. What happened? Corona, COVID 19. Oh. I'm so much disturbed. My family life is disturbed. My business is disturbed. I'm not able to concentrate. I it is a. Mm, it's okay, it's a common problem for all, everyone nowadays because every world is suffering. So we should not lose our patience at this time. We should invest this time by practicing spiritual uh, devotional practices more and more so that we can connect with Krishna. We have got that time, uh, that opportunity to do so. So, yeah. 
so uh, uh, okay I, if you say i will uh, try to this but whenever i ask some question to you you only refer these things uh, so can you tell me what benefit i will get if we do all these things uh, you can this is a kind of dhyan yoga you can do at this time because uh, in, in an intelligent person as lord krishna has said to arjuna in bhagavad gita that an intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with material senses because these are temporary if it is there now it will not go longer it has an end because it is on temporary platform uh, whatever sorrow and happiness we get in our life is due to our previous karmas also uh, just like we don't we don't invite happiness in our life it comes automatically due to our previous karmas uh, it's just it's just sorrow is, al- sorrow is also like that uh, it comes uh, due to our previous karmas but it don't stay longer it's the part of life we have to uh, but it doesn't mean that we should forget lord krishna in this all this scenario we have to do our devotional practice on timely basis so is it fine pasarthi uh, prabhu ji okay mata ji i'll try thank you so much for your guidance so you know i'm i'm not so happy that this is gyana yoga gyana yoga is not speaking about devotional practices but it just explaining the knowledge that ultimate life is temporary the material problem is all temporary we're not the body the, the, you have to explain like that that is more the process of gyana yoga let's hear group number 5 krishna maharaj i'll be speaking on behalf of group 5 so um we, since gyana yoga we, the, in the text that was given to us it says that intelligent people intelligent persons the mystics they understand that uh, material pleasures come from material senses and are therefore temporary and therefore a wise man does not delight in them he stays away from such material senses and material pleasures and it say and, and the next text goes on to talk about how if one is able to tolerate the urges of the material senses then he is situated uh, and he is he is in a state of happiness he is he is does not fall into the clutches of misery and uh, and it is gyana yoga it a person a wise person a mystic they they find happiness within and that's why they sit and concentrate on in, in within and find happiness within and he is liberated in the supreme and ultimately he attains the supreme so they sit silently at a place and enjoy the activities of life from within that is uh, this is called brahma bhuta or attaining which one is assured of going back to god head back to home so we discussed but we couldn't do more but uh, we discussed the examples of the four kumaras and shukadev goswami uh, under this marriage so Uh, is the gyani yogi going to go back to godhead is he going to go to the goloka vrindavan or vaikuntha it's uh, yes ma it says here that uh, he is attaining one attaining which one is assured of going back to godhead so the brahma bhuta state i mean they have to sit it is a very difficult practice to sit silently at any place and enjoy the activities of life from within but uh, that is what pure gyani yoga Yes. Yeah. yeah usually we find the gyani yogis they go more to the brahman they're impersonalists yes but they, of course unless they become devotees they may get some or we do say the goal the goal of knowledge is to know vasudev sarvamiti samahatma sadurlabha so some rare gyani he may go back to godhead okay thank you maraji let's hear group number 6 Dhyana Yoga Hare Krishna Maharaj I will present our group Yes uh verse number 13 and 14 Krishna is explaining the main principles of Dhyana Yoga he starts with how a, a yogi would uh, someone who is performing Dhyana Yoga would sit in a particular position 
and he would keep his body, neck and head erect in straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose. And then uh, Krishna talks about what should be his mental situation. He says that his mind should be unagitated, it should be subdued mind, and it should be devoid of fear. He specifically talks about devoid of fear and completely free from sex life. One should meditate upon me within the heart and make me the ultimate goal of life. So all this process of uh, Dhyana Yoga is, uh, is, is described and then uh, Prabhupada in purport is highlighting how uh, to practice controlling the mind and avoiding all kind of sense gratification of which uh, Prabhupada says sex life is the chief. And then he talks about how the celibacy is, is, is the key important part in Dhyana Yoga. Now, afterwards, Prabhupada is describing how actually each item or each principle of Dhyana Yoga can be performed by doing the Bhakti Yoga rather than doing the Dhyana Yoga and how uh, you know, like he compares each and every item of uh, Dhyana Yoga. He talks about how the uh, how to control the mind by being, you know, like I mean, uh, he's quoting the verse 2.59 where we say when you are then Param Dashtava So he talks about how we can engage in the higher taste and thus we can control our senses. And he talks about how we can, you know, get trained Became becoming a brahmachari so that our sex life can be controlled. And then he talks about how we can get into the grastha ashram and still control the, the sex life by regulating our sex life and just having the Krishna conscious children. And uh, and then he compares, uh, uh, yeah, so basically he says that like a Krishna conscious person is already the best of all yogis. So this is how Dhyana Yoga is being, you know, compared and, and, uh, and, uh, and with the Bhakti Yoga and how Bhakti Yoga is superior to the Dhyana Yoga. This is what is described in the Okay. Words. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Very good, yes. Okay, group number three, do you have anything to add on to this? Hare Krishna Maharaji. Like Prabhu, he has almost told everything we covered, every aspect. But still, we would like to add few points, like... Uh, we can take the example of like in the scripture Dhruv Maharaj how he meditated on the name of the Lord Krishna Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya that Nara Unity taught him like to concentrate on this mantra so you will get the God love of Godhead. So Lord Vishnu appeared with, uh, in front of him with the four-handed form in front of Dhruv Maharaj. And similarly Prahlad Maharaj we can take the example of him also like he also meditated, meditated on the God same. Uh, as instructed by the Narad Muni. So these are some, some examples from the scripture from, we, from which we can understand how they regulated their life on um, the devotional service. Who, who was the one who was instructed by Narada Muni? Prahlad Maharaj and Dhruva Maharaj. Oh, Prahlad Maharaj. Okay, Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Okay, let's go ahead. So yoga processes described in these verses. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, in regards to the yoga system, uh, you were mentioning uh, very rarely someone from uh, a Jnana Yoga who is practicing may achieve uh, Krishna Consciousness. Uh, in my understanding of the yoga ladder, is that those who are practicing, except for Bhakti Yoga, those who are practicing this different system of yoga, is to bring them to the point of bhakti yoga. So, if you could give them an explanation there on how does the jnana yoga, um, yogi attain Krishna consciousness? How does the jnana yogi come to Krishna consciousness? Well, the goal it described, there's a verse, right? After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing that Krishna Vasudeva is everything. Such a soul is very rare. And so they come to Krishna consciousness by the result of their meditation. They realize finally that Vasudeva Krishna is everything. And then they surrender to Krishna and become devotees. 
That's one that's way. That's when Bhakti Yoga started to, to take place. When uh, this become... What? That is when they started to practice Bhakti Yoga. Or devotional service. That is when they come to Bhakti Yoga, yes. Yes. Yes, Martin. Just I just want to clarify that. But they could also they could also come from Jnana Yoga, they could go on to Dhyana Yoga to do the meditation. And the yogi meditates and he realizes Krishna in the heart, the super soul, and he surrenders to the super soul. And then he takes up devotional service. Yes, Maharaj. That's when Krishna uh, sends the Guru. Not necessarily. So just simply by their meditation, they can realize, they realize the super soul and they see themselves as different from the super soul and they surrender to the super soul. Thank you, They may have a guru, they may not, but they, somehow they come to the position of understanding bhakti yoga as a culmination of their yoga practice. So then they engage in service, right? So the process of karma yoga described here, 248. Yogastha kuru karmani sangam takva dhananjaya siddhya siddhiyo samabhutva samadvam yoga uchate. Perform your duty equipoise to Arjuna, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. So, you can see the aspects of karma yoga. Perform your duty. You have to do the duty. The work is there. But at the same time, give up the attachment to success and failure. So that even-mindedness, that equanimity is called yoga. That you're not attached to success or failure because we understand I'm not the controller, I'm not the supreme, I'm just simply doing my duty. Sometimes you may be successful, sometimes you fail, but the important thing is we try, we, we perform the duty. So this is called yoga, and then that's one verse. So highlighted, abandoning all attachment, the important aspect of karma yoga detachment. Then jnana. Jnana refers to knowledge of self as distinguished from non-self or in other words knowledge that the spirit soul is not the body. So knowledge refers to the self, the atma, the soul as distinguished from the non-self, the body. So knowledge that the spirit soul is not the body. So this is the aspect of Gyan. Another verse, 213, well-known verse, right? The soul, an embodied soul, as the embodied soul continually passes in this body, from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. So the jnani understands this, he understands the nature of the, the soul, the difference between the soul and the body. But he may not know about the relationship between the soul and the super soul. Jnana yoga, when the linking process is predominantly empirical, it is called jnana yoga. The linking process is predominantly empirical. It is called jnana yoga. Empirical meaning based on observation. Okay, let's go back. So, the linking process, the yoga is the linking process. And this particular linking process is called jnana yoga. So when the, the, you see, jnana yoga is based on observation, not activity, just simply observing. 
just simply seeing, contemplating, contemplating maybe some meditation may be there also, but contemplating, the, seeing the nature of the material world and becoming aloof from it, keeping away from the material pleasures. So observation. We see people die, just like Lord Buddha. He saw, he saw, an, he saw an old man and he asked, will I also become old? And so, yeah, everyone becomes old. And he saw a diseased person, he said, well, I also get disease. He said, well, usually everybody gets some kind of disease. And then he saw a dead person. He said, well, I have to die. And he said, yeah, everyone dies. Everyone who takes birth is going to die. So then Lord Buddha, he observed all, all of these things. And so he said, I don't want anything to do with this world. And he renounced the world based on his observation. So that's like Jnana Yoga like that. The process of Jnana Yoga described in the fifth chapter. Yehi samsparsha jaboka dukha yonaya evate adi antabanta kunteya nateshu ramate buddha. An intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with the material senses. O oh, son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise man does not delight in them. So, the sources of misery, again, you can see observing, we see the misery of the material world. So the, the wise man keeps away from it. He understands material pleasures have a beginning and an end. What's the point? Why bother? Better not to get entangled, keep away. So this is jnana yoga. They don't take part in these things. They know it's just going to lead to misery. And then dhyana yoga, meditation, and we had described. Sit in a secluded, sit, one should go, to practice yoga, one should go to a secluded place, not just sit at home. Lay kusha grass on the ground, cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth. The seat should be neither too high nor too low, it should be in a sacred place. The yogi should sit on it very firmly and should practice yoga to purify the heart by controlling his mind, senses and activities, fixing the mind on one point. This natural transcendental pleasure is the ultimate goal of yoga and is easily achieved by execution of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga will be vividly described in the seventh chapter from Bhagavad Gita 620 purport. All right, so what we covered today, we had a review of the third chapter. We looked at the connections between the 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th chapters and we've also been looking at the different yoga processes, karma, kanda, karma yoga, jnana yoga and jnana yoga. And we've been discussing the practices of these different processes along with verses from the scripture. Oh, identify contemporary philosophies which reflect the principles of these yoga processes. Well, meditation is quite common. Many philosophies involve meditation. We have a lot of different meditational groups. So some sit contemporary Buddhism, they like to do meditation. They also have some Gyan, Karma Yoga, detached work, who's doing Karma Yoga. There are different impersonal yoga groups also. Impersonalists, they also do Karma Yoga. If you go to the Divine Life Yoga Center in Rishikesh, they will ask you, would you like to do some Karma Yoga today? 
and they may hand you the broom, tell you to sweep the floor, or they may tell you go and help cut the potatoes. That's karma yoga for them. They do karma yoga. They talk about karma yoga. They don't talk about bhakti. So karma yoga, detached work. And they don't talk about who they're doing it for, just be detached. And then personal application, general principles from Krishna's analysis of lust and the application of these principles in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. All right? We want to apply these principles, not just only talk, we want to put them into practice. Okay? Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Any questions before we close? Anybody? Any question? No? Okay. So Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, in uh, uh, previous lectures, uh, you gave, uh, you told us that uh, the incident of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanand Rai. In that you quoted one uh, shloka from Srimad Bhagavatam in which Ramanand Rai uh, was uh, describing the devotional, pure devotional service. So Maharaj, can you uh, tell the shloka number? Oh, I... well, it's in the 10th chapter. Let me look. I've got, I'll just check. I have to go to the computer to tell you the exact verse. Uh, it's in the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's spoken by Lord Brahma. Let me see. Go, go around the other door. Wait. Okay, Mataji. It's chapter 10. Canto 10, chapter 14. Text number 3. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.